Good morning. We are just so thrilled to have each and every one of you with us this morning worshiping. And were you waving at me, Alex? Because I'm waving back. Good morning to you as well. And we're just uh, so thrilled to have everyone here. And uh, you should have seen some of the transitions that were going on. Yesterday we came in and realized that uh, we had cleared the space from Vacation Bible School, but we hadn't put anything back up. And I'll tell you, without the decorations, it looks bare. It looks very bare. So thank you so much to... uh, to Debbie for making our platform look. She doesn't like to be called out. Thank you so much to the person who does our decorating for us. <laughs> years ago, years ago, um, my wife said, please don't mention me from up front. Please never mention me from up front. This was in our first church. And I, it was about to come out of my mouth. Uh, and I said, we'll just call the person. And I couldn't think of anything. And I said, Rochelle. (laughs) Welcome uh, to Willowbrook. There are a couple of items. We're going to go past our uh, typical one or two announcement items. These are in your bulletin. There are some that aren't. We just want to make sure that they're all on your radar. There are important things going on. Um, The first of which is that there's a church picnic coming up. August 20, that's not next Sabbath, but the Sabbath after that. It's going to be at Lions Park in Smithsburg, and you're all invited to participate. Please come. It's an all-church activity. That same day, we're going to have our teacher dedication, and uh, we're getting the word out to our teachers there at at Mount Etna School and Highland View Academy, and we're inviting them to join us for the picnic as well. So it's going to be a big day for us. So that's at Lions Park in Smithsburg. More information with details and directions will be coming on that particular day. Um, There is, uh, I'm getting text messages from folks about certain announcements that need to be made and uh, reminders, one that isn't in your bulletin. If you want your cactus back, Remember, we had Cactusville, and we all made cactuses. And if you would like your cactus back to decorate at home with or as a souvenir of some sort, please take it today because tomorrow they go in the dumpster. Okay? If, If you are here and you see someone doesn't want their cactus and you want their cactus, you're welcome to it because tomorrow they go in the dumpster. Um, tomorrow is a big day here if you want to come out and help at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So what, something we do every year following Vacation Bible School is we get the carpets cleaned. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, the carpets are being cleaned Monday and Tuesday of this week. And so we have to move all the furniture in many of the Sabbath School rooms and in Payton Hall And uh, that takes a small army to get all that done. So if you are uh, willing to give us a hand with that tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, we'd greatly appreciate it. If moving furniture isn't your thing, but you're more skilled with a paintbrush, be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock because we're also going to paint Payton Hall. It's going to be a busy day tomorrow. So I've covered the cacti, and I've covered... Um, I'm trying to make sure the text message that I got was from our principal at Mount Etna School wants you to be reminded that of two things. Monday afternoon, it's in, it's in the back of your bulletin here, Monday afternoon from 4 to 8 p.m., there's a work bee at the school. And if you could spare a little bit of time and help them out there, that, they would greatly appreciate it. But also... What he really wants you to be aware of is on Thursday evening, August 11, that's this week from 6 to 8 p.m., it's the meet and greet with the teachers, especially if you have little ones um, that are in school or should be in school and want to check out Mount Etna School, that would be a great opportunity to do so. They have refreshments that are going to be there, and uh, and you can just fellowship with uh parents and and teachers uh, there at the school. So that is what I have for you today. The rest of the announcements you can read for yourselves. Uh, We've highlighted the very, very important ones. 
And finally, deaconesses, do not forget that you have a meeting after the service today. So if you're a deaconess, there is a special luncheon and meeting for you after the service today. Our health ministries is, is going strong, and they have prepared for us another health nugget video. There's new research on how what you eat can affect how you sleep. Study finds that just one day of eating foods high in saturated fat and sugar, but low in fiber could mean lighter and more disrupted rest. Michael Bruce is a clinical psychologist, and he's also a specialist in sleep medicine, and he joins us once again at the table. Always good to see you, Dr. Bruce. Always great to be here. Thanks for having me. So we all know cupcakes aren't good right before you go to bed, but who <laughs> knew it could affect your sleep? Well, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. This study was quite fascinating because they had people on a controlled diet, and then they let them loose for a day, and then they wanted to see how it affected their sleep. And on the controlled diet, their sleep actually looked pretty good. And the second they let people loose to make their own food decisions, took longer to fall asleep, you got less slow wave sleep, and more arousals, meaning the quality of that sleep went down what pretty significantly. What physiologically is happening because of that? Well, we're guessing, because we don't know 100% for sure, but we think that the increase in the sugars and the fats actually move your circadian rhythm. So remember your internal biological clock, it kind of turns people into night owls, and it pushes their melatonin production later, which makes it more difficult to fall and asleep. what does fiber do that it's beneficial? Well, fiber does a lot of things that are beneficial um, for us. We need fiber. It's, doesn't it get things moving? It does get things yeah. moving, which is yeah. absolutely true. And there's lots moving of, down there. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's lots of places to get fiber, too, not just on kind of the traditional things. There's beans, there's legumes, there's Brussels sprouts, there's broccoli, even some fruits like blackberries, raspberries, pears. So it, it actually is something that you can put into your diet on a regular basis and make yourself sleep a lot better. So if it has huge consequences over one day of sleeping, what, what is a long time effect? That's the real question here, right? So this was a very controlled study and we, don't, we know what happens in one day, but what we don't know is if we're not eating really well for long periods of time, could this be something that's underlying a lot of people's sleep problems? In my practice, I'm often asking people about their diet. Um, because remember, when you don't sleep well, it's very difficult to lose weight. Um, I actually had that book about it, The Sleep Doctor's mm -hmm. Diet Plan. Mm -hmm. And so pretty interesting stuff now that we're thinking, wow, diet really can have a significant effect in the other direction as well. Yeah. If we sleep less, we also eat more. Exactly. It turns out our cravings um, for all kinds of high-fat, high-carb mm -hmm. foods increase because we're trying to get serotonin in our system to calm us down. Thank you, Michael Bruce. Good Thank to see you. you. My mom always says, have a PB&J and a glass of milk. It'll always help. <laughs> PB&J and a glass of milk, right before yeah. you go to bed? Yeah, it'll help you sleep oh, better. Man. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So I sure hope our screen goes good today because I didn't bring a hymnal up here. But I do have my list of songs. I would like you to introduce you, Kiara. She's going to be playing the piano for us this morning. And we're going to start with number 608, Faith is the Victory. Number 608.
Our next song is Have Thine Own Way, Lord, number 567. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. <clears throat> song this morning is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, number 569. Please stand. <clears throat>
Good morning and happy Sabbath. The scripture reading for today is Luke 9, 57 to 60. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will not follow thee whithersoever. I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Let me turn my mic on. Thank you to Kiera for company us, accompanying uh, Penny on the piano. That was uh, very lovely. Thank you very much. The last song that we sang, um, Do Not Pass Me By, Fanny Crosby wrote that song. And um, she thought of the words as she was uh, conducting prison ministry. And as she was leaving the prison one night, she overheard someone's prayer. And in that prayer, they were pleading with the Lord, O gentle Savior. And she wrote the poem that became the song. I thought that would be an interesting tidbit for you this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we share in the prayer of that prison inmate. Here we are, asking that you do not pass us by, knowing that you have longed for this hour all week, that you have longed for us to observe the Sabbath with you and to spend those 24 hours in worship of you. But this collective worship that we've come together, we pray that you would bless because your presence is here, because we have come in your name. Let our voices be lifted high. Let our thoughts rise higher than they will any other time in the week. And may we, Lord, see your face is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath again to you. You know, this is always a very special time of our worship time when we have the opportunity of giving back. And before I actually have a prayer, and before you actually do your thing with your tithe envelopes or if you've done online, I'd like you to have this thought with me. This is a a scripture that comes from 1 Chronicles 29.14, talking about the blessings and the prayer that he had to God and the rewards that happened thereafter, and this is what the verse says. But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to give as generously as you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand? So our generosity is inspired by God's generosity. In preparation for the construction of the temple, the Bible reports about the generosity of Israel. First, King David gave lavishly out of his own personal treasures. Then the other leaders gave willingly, following his example. Now inspired by their leaders, the rest of the people gave freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. That should be our desire too, should it not? Live by the examples that have been set for us. And may we be giving generously for what the ministries of this church has. As uh, our offering today is for the local church budget, we do that twice a month here. And we appreciate, as Darlene mentioned last week, the faithfulness 
and the generosity of our congregation to keep these ministries going. So thank you for continuing to do that. Remembering, tithe envelopes can go in the plate in the back or in the little box by the AV room. We also will allow you to mail in your contributions directly to the church. And for those that are giving online and those of you that are watching us on YouTube and Facebook, we appreciate you going online and giving your contributions through willowbrook.church. So may we bow your heads together with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share your generosity with us and our generosity back to you. Father, you embrace us in so many ways and you keep our existence from day to day and we are so appreciative of that. And this is just a small portion of our love back to you for the way you love us. Thank you, Father, for blessing us and being with us as we give this offering back to you. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, boys and girls, it's also your time to do your activity. Where are those dollar bills? Okay, boys and girls, could you help me collect our offering for our children's ministries here for our Mount Etna and Highland View education. And Uncle Glenn is going to have our story this morning. So members, please raise your hands up with those dollars, those fives, those tens, those twenties, those fifties, whatever you got. Right, Glenn? Yes, go. Anyway, the young people will pick it up and thank you again. Go ahead and come up and have a seat up here on the front row or two. We may need two rows this morning. Well, good morning. I'm going to let you in on a secret. We have a special test that we give potential employees at Mount Utna Retreat Center. Now, my staff doesn't even know this secret, okay? But you need to listen to this. You see, we like to take people out and walk around the campus to show them where things are, where the different activities and buildings are. And I'm always watching to see if they walk by trash on the ground. And if they do, that's a bad thing. If they scoop down and pick it up and look around for a trash can, that's a good thing. Because our job at the retreat center is to provide hospitality, to provide service, to care for people in very physical ways. 
And so far, by caring for the earth, by picking up that trash is a good indicator. Are they going to notice those kinds of things or they are, or are they oblivious to it? Will they just keep walking by? My, one of my staff members told me one time that they were on vacation down on the Gulf Coast and they stayed in a very nice hotel, but uh, they needed an extra bed. And so they had called ahead and reserved what's called a rollaway. Do any of you know what a rollaway bed is? Okay, that's what it looks like. It is a medieval torture device. Okay, I am very serious. It is designed that whoever sleeps in it will not sleep at all. They will be miserable the whole night thinking they're going to sleep, but it's about the most uncomfortable bed in existence. But we had ordered one of those, and, uh, or excuse me, the, the guy had ordered one. I've ordered them many times with Pathfinder trips. And so the family had ordered one, and when they got to the hotel, they told me it wasn't in the room. And so they went back down to the front desk, and they asked, we ordered a, a desk can, or a rollaway. Can we have that? And they were assured that it would be there soon. So they went out to supper. They came back and guess what? No roll away in the room. And so my employee went down and he went to the front desk and, and there was a long line at the front desk of people checking in. And so he waited for the long line. And the person right in front of him, he said, was, was a middle-aged woman who, whose name was Karen. No offense to the Karens in the room, I know it's a... And she started screaming at the desk worker because the rollaway that she had ordered was not in the room. And the line was just so long. And so when my worker stepped up, he could see the guy was drained. And he, he said, I know, I haven't gotten there. He said, I'm too busy. Look at the line here, it's just crazy. So my guy said, well, what if I stand desk for you? I work at Mount to Retreat Center in Maryland. And we check in people, could I stand desk for you while you go and get it? And he said, oh, no, I'm not allowed to put anyone from that's not an employee behind the counter. So he paused, well, then would you let me get the roll away? In fact, I'll get both of them. You would do that? Sure. So the key was handed off, the rollaways were brought out and returned, and everybody was happy. The family decided they wanted to stay an extra day. And so they went down to check the next morning, and the guy says, we actually have a room, but the price went up $100 because it was a weekend now. So instead of being $100 a night, it was $200 a night. And he looked at my employee and said, yeah, but you're an employee here. So I'll give you the discount that I get, and it was $80 for the room. <laughs> because of the willingness to serve. Now we have another picture that's gonna show up here. Uh, it's a picture from Atholton School down in Columbia, Maryland. And uh, you may have heard in the news, there are people from a country called Afghanistan, and many of them ran from the country very quickly because some, some very, difficult people took over their country. And so they came here and they were living in hotels and they really didn't have anything. They got to bring one suitcase with them. That was it. And so Atherton School decided they were going to do something very special for them and they gathered up lots of clothing and lots of supplies. And then they went one step farther. They staffed the event with only women. Does anybody know why they would have only women in the event. Yeah. That's a good answer because the men would go to war. Well, there were lots of men there and, and it was an American thing. I'm curious if anybody in the audience, in the congregation, do you have an idea of why? Penny. That's right. Because these refugee women are not allowed to talk to men who are not in their family. And they recognized that it was the mothers that needed the most help. And so they staffed the event mainly with women. 
They had some children's activities, and the women came and were able, through translators, to gather the supplies that they need to talk about issues that mothers have anywhere in the world, to find out where to go to resources, and to be able to learn more about living here in Maryland. And do you know what they did not talk about? They didn't talk about Jesus. Not a single word was said talking about Jesus. But did they talk about Jesus? Yeah, because they acted like Jesus. They cared for people. Many times you will have the opportunity to serve other people by simply doing something that they need done, by treating them as you would like to be treated. And that is still an act of service, and it still is a testimony of Jesus who loves you and has given you everything. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Glenn, for that great story. And, and really, when you think about it, that fits right here, doesn't it? We are all servants, and that's why we have the ministries that we do here at this church and why you participate the way that you do. You know, I was going to make, before I had our prayer this morning, just a, a compliment here, again, to our Vacation Bible School volunteers. Wow, that was a fabulous program that you put on. I wish I could have been here, but I saw the aftermath last Sunday when I helped clean up, but it was fabulous. And we have some children here today that came to Vacation Bible School. So praise you all for doing that and bringing them into our church from our community. <laughs> that a boy, Billy. All right. Could you do me one other favor here? Go back to your bulletin. We have this page in the bulletin where we have prayer requests. And I show, sure hope that you all are taking a look at this list. You probably even know certain circumstances of why these requests have been asked. I know for sure our Lord does. And I know that you care enough that you will also remember these people in your daily devotions as their circumstances are still happening and there's still hurt and need going on. Keep these people in prayer. All right, I'd like to invite you, where possible, if you can, to kneel with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, again, as we come before you on this Sabbath day, you've gathered us here for this purpose. We worship you today, Father, and we hope that it will be acceptable to you. We realize, Father, that we are really not worthy to even come to your throne and ask for ourselves, for blessings, and these that are on our prayer list for their needs. Father, we just want to devote them to you in a very special way that you can honor their requests. You know, I think, Father, of how you're watching over our universe. You created it. And you're watching what's happening all around us in this world. Our hearts still go out to those that are struggling in the Ukraine for that senseless battle that's going on. We know, Father, that your angels are over there watching over the people that are faithful to you. And we are so grateful for that. And we ask for that continued blessing. I think, too, Father, of the way that you watch out for our, our church. There are many things going on in our church as we have been reminded again of those on our prayer list. There are many needs. There are many hardships, many sufferings that are going on. This week, Father, as you know, we lost a member of our church family, the son of Jerry and Carolyn. Oh, Father, every time we lose one, our hearts go out to heaven and say, please, save us. Most of all, save them. 
There are so many in this church that have gone through loss in the last year or so. And we know, Father, that your comforting spirit is the only thing that can bring that blessing to them. So we ask once again that you'd be with each family that has suffered a loss here in this church. We think of those that are going through health issues. You know their needs. And we thank you so much for looking over their needs. I think of Kimmy, Kimmy Emmerich. Father, what a blessing she is in her nursing home. We don't understand why you keep her alive, but we realize she's a witness. Think of Tim's daughter, Molly. Father, thank you for bringing her around and her health, that she's able to get back to some normal activities. And others of our congregation that we've prayed for, Father, you've blessed us. And it strengthens our faith when we see you working after we've asked. Oh, Father, there's so many things on our hearts and minds today. Those that may be having financial issues, we just ask for your spirit to be with them. Give them strength. Give them hope. Give them your love right there by their side that everything will turn out well. We think of those of our family that are traveling. It's getting close to the end of summer. Be with them. Give them traveling mercies and protection of your angels there and watch over them to bring them back to us. And I think two of our children. You saw the number of children that came up for this story, Father. We are blessed. But soon they're going to be going back to school. We thank you for watching over them during this school year. Those that are going to Highland View and Mount Etna, but all of our schools, bless the teachers, bless the faculty, bless all that are going to be working with these young people, that they can see Jesus while they're at school. Father, there are so many things on our hearts and minds today. You know what each one is. We want to glorify you in this service today. We want you to be in our hearts and our minds as we go out from this place and represent you. And Father, we know that your coming is soon. Prepare us for that soon second coming is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Julianne, for uh, playing the special music for us this morning. I didn't have to twist her arm. She actually volunteered. Said, Daddy, I've got a song. Would you like special music this week? And I said, let me check and see if we have any. I would venture to guess that if I were to poll the congregation, many of you would say that you feel unprepared to serve if God were to call you to serve. In fact, I would be bold enough to say that, that I'm almost tempted to ask you to raise your hands, but I, I don't want to embarrass Debbie any more than I already have today. So I won't. <laughs> I'm going to catch it, you know. I am going to get it. And I'm, now I'm more worried about how I'm going to get it than <laughs> I'm having a hard time getting my mind back. <laughs> uh, and so we put off serving because we just feel ill-equipped, unprepared. And then there's another side of this equation where we may feel prepared to serve and we feel like the church has called us to serve and so we come to serve, but we don't recognize that when, when we serve within the halls of the church, within the ministries of the church, we are not serving to the full extent that God is calling us to serve. Because service in God's kingdom isn't just in his house. Service in God's kingdom includes his backyard as well. We're going to unpack what that means. We are into our series uh, where we're going through and looking at the biblical and theological foundations of our strategic plan for this year. And uh, let's go through those strategic goals real quick and we'll come back to talking about what service is. We started off with the goal of rebuilding our community and a sense of fellowship amongst our members. And we talked about how we're going to do that in a small group ministry here. And I'm excited by those who have, have already come forward very eager and can't wait to get involved in small group ministry. We're going to get you plugged in. This is going to be fantastic. And for those of you that aren't quite as eager, we're going to get you plugged in as well. It's going to be fantastic. Our second goal we covered last week, which was to grow young. Uh, who knew that we would put that goal out and, and then we would have a bumper crop of, of young people last week and this week as well. Praise the Lord, we are growing young. Our third goal is to minister to our community, our neighbors, more intentionally, organically, and without conditions. In other words, love your neighborhood through Adventist Community Services, redefining what ACS really does and how it functions. The story, the children's story that Glenn gave this morning was spot on. Uh, thank you for coming in in a pinch, Glenn, and, and giving that story for us. The, um, the next four goals we're going to cover in future weeks uh, to achieve financial stability and health to improve and grow our online presence, to retake the natural church development survey and work on our minimum factor, which is to grow healthy spiritually amongst what we do here, and to revitalize and reorganize a collegiate young adult ministry. And we want to make sure that we keep all of our young people plugged in. But for this week, we are talking about serving in God's backyard. There's a story in the Gospel of Luke we read in the Scripture, Mary read for us, in Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 57. And I made an error, and it was too late to correct it when I discovered it, um, and said that we were going to stop at verse 60, but we're actually going to verse 62 and read the whole story. So Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62 Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. I almost tempted not to advance the slide, because I know that's what you're all waiting for. You're going to put it on the screen. We're just going to read along with you. 
I want you to know where it is in your Bible. In chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, the scripture says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, not your typical reply when someone says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And you would think that the response would be, get in line, let's go. You know, that's what we do here at church, right? I'll follow you wherever you go. That's fantastic. Let's throw a party. But Jesus instead says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And I can imagine the man's wheels and his head turning. What does he mean by this? It's like my mother, we used to ask her, what time is it? And she said, it's, it's time all old dogs are dead. Aren't you glad you're a pup? Does she even know what that means? <laughs> Imagine this man processing Jesus' response. It could even come across somewhat as an insult. You're, you don't know what you're really asking for. You're asking to follow me. You really don't know what you're asking for. I don't even have a place to stay. He said to another man, follow me, but he replied, now the first man, remember, is asking or or committing himself to follow Jesus, and Jesus is saying, there's nowhere to follow. I don't even know where I'm going. Stay tonight. The second man, Jesus says, follow me, and his reply was, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Have you ever seen a dead person bury a dead person? We'll unpack that a little bit more. Still another said, I will follow you. I'm committed. I'm in this. I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, probably the harshest of the rebukes that we're going to see here, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and has second thoughts, remembers the way things used to be and pines for them, is fit for service. In the kingdom of God. It may be difficult for you to imagine a pastor saying any one of these things to anybody who wanted to volunteer in church, right? You have nominating committee come along and they nominate everybody and then the pastor says, no, (laughs) it's not going to work. Jesus doesn't actually say no, but he is saying no. He's pointing out specific reasons why these individuals are unfit to serve. But before we get into those reasons, I want to point out a couple of things about the actual call that he's giving. Because we have to understand the call when he says, follow me, what he's actually asking of us. And then we can look at the responses, and then we'll look at how this all fits into God's big backyard, because it's pretty big. The first call is a universal call. Notice that his call to follow me, although there was, um, well, the the gospel of Matthew kind of clues us in that the, the first man in the story here is a Pharisee that says, I'll follow you. And so he probably was pretty put off by Jesus' words. The others aren't identified, but they all received the same call, follow me. It's the same call that Jesus gave to the fishermen by the seaside, follow me. It's the same call that you got when the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart 
and you decided to join his family and to be baptized, follow me. The call is universal. It doesn't change. It's the same call over and over and over again. Peter got it. James got it. John got it. Paul got it. You got the same call. Follow me. It's simple, and yet it's profound. It's a volitional call. What do we mean by that? You have to choose it. You can reject it. You aren't forced into the call, which is what we see in this story that we're unpacking here. It's volitional. You choose whether or not you want to be a part of follow me. You can easily say, nope, that doesn't work for me. There are dire consequences when you do, but you can. You can say, I, I, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to follow. Which, by the way, you're not a Christian once you do that. You're no longer Christ-like the minute you say, I, I, I'll take on the name, but I won't follow. It has to be from your will, your desire. You have to choose to follow. It's a general call. It's not specific in any way, shape, or form. Follow me. To what? I don't know. Follow me. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of faith, a general call in which you surrender yourself and you say, I don't know what you're calling me to, but I know that you're calling me and I will go and I will do. I'm willing to trust that whatever you call me to, you will prepare me for. You will equip me for. You will lead me through. So the call is general. And by faith, not knowing what tomorrow holds, I will follow. There were times in the story of Paul when Paul would want to do something, but he was following the call so much that he records that the Spirit of the Lord pre prohibited him from going to one place and sent him to another. He had his plans, but he put his plans on hold because the call is to follow God, not my will, not my own plans. Now, although the call is general and we don't know where it is leading, it is also directional because follow me means that you have to move. You cannot stay where you were and be following Jesus. There is a movement that must take place. It is by faith agreeing with Jesus that by following him, he will lead you to what he wants you to do. So although it is general, it becomes specific. Once you accept the call, and then it becomes directional, and you have to go where he leads you to go. I would not be standing before you today if I had not received the call to follow me. In fact, I shouldn't be standing before you today because I didn't like the call and I didn't want the call. I wanted to do something else. But someone kept nagging at me. It wasn't someone, it was someones. The Spirit was working through three individuals over the course of one summer that finally brought me to the point where I realized that I was really receiving a call to serve God. And then it became directional. Once I accepted the call, I knew what I had to do. And I went and I did it. So why were these followers... Why were these disciples unfit to serve? We are introduced in the text here to three excuses, uh, which really challenge us, are uh, really uh, challenges or obstacles that we all still face today. And if you sit and you think about the different things that may be happening in your life uh, and, and the call that you may receive to serve God, you could probably come up with other excuses. But in this text, these are three. And if we were to say uh, that we're looking at a list, the, the, and, and the list could be long, these are probably in the top ten. Are you with me? They're probably the top three of the top ten. 
So let's take a look. What is the first excuse? The first excuse was, or the first one, he, he asks, uh, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' response was, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And Jesus addresses the issue of security. Not a sense of being under attack or a sense of security that you need to protect yourself, but a sense of security that we become comfortable and we feel secure in our surroundings. We feel secure in our lifestyle. And sometimes God's call is a call that may disrupt our lifestyle. I have a friend who received a call. He was the president of a company and 20 some odd years ago, he received a call to leave his work as the president of this company and go and be the business manager of an Adventist academy and take a significant pay cut. He's still serving as, a, as the uh, business manager of an Adventist academy today because he heard the call. And he was more interested in serving in God's backyard than he was in making money and being secure with a nice house and having all the toys and so forth. There are many different ways that we feel uh, secure, things that give us security. Remember I mentioned that the first person who said, I will follow you, Matthew says, was a Pharisee who made that comment, which means they enjoyed quite a bit of political privilege. It would be the equivalent today of someone on Capitol Hill walking around and expecting everybody to know who they were and what they represented. And there would be certain privileges, social and political and even religious in his culture that they would receive. Today we can sit and say, are we deriving our security from our worldly possessions, our identity, our position in the marketplace, our popularity at school? What, what is our security blanket that holds us back? From going when Jesus calls us to to go? Is it our education? Is it athletic prowess, material possessions, business success, significant relationships, or fill in the blank because the list can go on and on and on of things that we might hold as more important than serving God? The second on the list was a sense of urgency. Take a look at that exchange found in verse 59. And he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Many commentators agree on this passage of scripture that the man's father was not dead. Well, he wasn't saying, look, my dad just died. Come on, give me a break. Let me have a funeral. Instead, he was saying, my father is still living. I haven't received my inheritance yet. We haven't taken care of his estate. Let first my father die and let me bury him and settle all the affairs and then I'll follow you. Indefinitely putting off the call to follow Jesus. Not sensing the urgency with which he was called because there were people who needed to hear the proclamation of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus was calling him to do. His call was becoming more specific by the moment. Go and tell people about the kingdom of God. But he didn't feel that sense of urgency and he thought he could put it off another day. Do we ever struggle with the idea that someday I will, and we fill in the blank, someday I will go and do this for the Lord, or someday I would like to do that for the Lord. 
If the Lord has put an idea in your heart, that idea has a sense of urgency to it. And you must follow and not say, it'll have to wait. It can wait till tomorrow. The third is tenacity. I love tenacity, except for when you run into a tenacious person. <laughs> it's no fun anymore. These are the folks who, who, who don't give up. They're, they're going to keep at it until they get what they've set their mind to. And in verses 61 and 62, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. This third prospect requested to follow, but he wanted to return to his family for a final visit, a final farewell. And Jesus lights into him with the harshest of the rebukes and says, you're not fit for service in the kingdom of God. You, you, you say, I'm going to go this direction, but the whole time you're looking that direction. And what, what's going on back here? Let me first go and do this. Let me first go and do that. You don't have the tenacity it's going to take to work in the kingdom of God because there's going to be distractions all around you. You're going to have guests coming to your house. You're going to have family members all the time. And you have to be tenacious. You have to stick to what you were called to do. You're not fit to serve. How many of us have taken the call We've joined the church, and we know we have to take up our cross and fight the good fight and stay the course and never get let go of the plow. We've, we've, got, you know, we've got songs about it. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. You know the song? Okay, maybe you don't. It's a great song. I'm not going to sing the rest of it for you, so don't hold your breath. We have all these things about what we are committing ourselves to when we come to Christ, but then once we realize that the call is directional and it starts becoming specific and we're being asked to actually do things within God's kingdom, the sad reality of most saints is that they let go of that plow and they quickly find something else to do. They find other interests Many times the world around them becomes more interesting than the things of God. Maybe they're knocked down by trials, or they just get the wind knocked out of their sail by some unkind word in the church. But most of the time, we, we struggle with something called drift. We just slowly drift away. Not from church altogether, but from our call. That, that thing that, that set a fire within us when we were first called into God's kingdom. And we end up in a state of complacency, no longer serving the way that we were meant to serve. So, serving in God's backyard, what does it look like? We have covered the concept of serving and the issues that keep us from serving, but we have to go one step further into the how. Uh, now that we know that there's a fitness for it, there's a call to it, and we've all received it when we were called into God's family, every single one of us is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. But how do we do what we're called to do? Matthew 25 helps us to answer that question. This is when I hear the pages of the Bible turning again, as all the saints in God's house are turning to Matthew chapter 25. And those online. In Matthew chapter 24, let's set the stage. The, 
the disciples ask Jesus about what the signs of the end are going to be like. And Jesus gives them all this list of things that are going to happen in preparation for the second coming. And then he goes in and he follows up in Matthew chapter 25 and he gives a series of parables also relating to the end of time and relating to the preparedness of God's people at the end. And as you get down towards the end, there is a section called the sheep and the goats. Now we do have a goat wrangler in our midst. We learned that at Vacation Bible School. And goats are an interesting breed of animal. It takes an interesting type of person to have a goat. In fact, I know folks that want to give away their goats. <laughs> We're not going to read the whole section. You're familiar with it. I just want to highlight a few verses. Matthew 25, verses 34 through 36. Then the king will say to those on his right, these are the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. In the verses just preceding this, he's talking about how judgment is coming. And how he looks out and he sees the sheep and the goats and he says to the sheep, look, you're, you've, you've done well. And so you're going to get the inheritance. The inheritance isn't based just on what they do. This is not a gospel of works. It's that their faith in Jesus to follow him led them into action. Look at what they did, that, that this faith that wells up inside of them, that can't sit still, that can't be complacent or a bench warmer. Look at what it does. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Kind of like Franny Crosby. When you go and you look at these words in the Greek, you will find that that um, Matthew is using the extremes. He's not, when he talks about, let's go back, when he talks about hungry, he's not talking about someone who's ready for the next meal. The word in Greek here is referring to someone who's on the verge of starvation. It's a matter of life and death. When he talks about someone who is thirsty, it is someone who isn't just like, wow, I could really use, would you like something refreshing while we sit down and chat? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the person who is near the point of, of dying from dehydration. The stranger is the foreigner, not just the person that you don't know. But it's, it's someone distant as well that you have invited in. And we could go on and on into the extremes here. What I want you to notice, and I'm going to say this carefully, do not stop listening at any point during the next several sentences. Otherwise, I may lose my job. Okay? Do I have your attention? Okay. I need wit. By the way, this is on YouTube. I could prove that. I didn't say that like they said I said it. Listen to the whole thing. In this discourse is preaching, Bible studies, evangelistic meetings. Are any of those mentioned? They are not, are they? Because they're, they're important. They have their place. In fact, we do them here. We're planning an, uh, an evangelistic series for a month from now, a month and a half from now. 
We believe in them. We have multiple Bible studies going on right now. We have baptisms that take place here because we know that people, this is the means by which they come into God's family, but it's not the means by which they start their journey in God's family, and that's what Jesus is pointing out. God's people need to be interested in all people, not just within his house, but those that are in his backyard as well, those that are in the neighborhoods and those that are on the streets. God's people are interested in all people because God's people have the heart of God beating within their chest. Jesus is alive and well within them, and so they are willing to do things that, are, that are, may seem odd and extraordinary in a culture where we become more and more private by the day, unless you get on Facebook, at which point you become public until you don't like what someone says about what you posted, and then you want to be private, which makes no sense. We gain spiritual influence by building relationship and gaining trust. And we do that by serving others. And so we engage people when they're hungry and when they're thirsty. When we see their needs, we have compassion like Jesus did. I love the story of the leper that came up to Jesus. And the the Greek says that when Jesus saw him, he had splat gizzo. Oh, wow, I love that word. That literally means we translate it into English saying he had compassion. The Greek, it literally means that his gut was wrenching inside of him and making him feel upset to the point where it was probably physically noticeable, that kind of compassion, where you can't, you don't want to live if you can't help. That's what the scripture said Jesus felt when he saw the leper And that's why Jesus was willing to do the unthinkable, the forbidden by the law, and reach out his hand and touch the leper. Because it's when people are in their dire needs that we can reach them and show them the compassion of Jesus, which is the first step of the gospel. To let them know that God loves them through how we love them. I've said this before. Is it okay if I quote a Catholic saint? I see some shrugging. You've you've gone this far. Might as well put the last nail in your coffin. Francis of Assisi. Although we may not agree with all of his theology, said something phenomenal. He said, preach often, and if necessary, use words. Let your life be the living example through the things you're doing for others, the way that you serve God. And this service needs to be unconditional. No strings attached. No, I will give if you get a, get, uh, will study the Bible with me. No, the compassion of Jesus Christ goes out to everyone And we allow the Spirit to do the work of calling in their hearts. And then the Spirit will say to the person, what's different about this person? Why do they always come to my rescue? Why are they there to help me? Why are they serving in God's big backyard? I need to know more about them and maybe more about this God who makes them different. Because then when that's in their mind and that's in their heart, they're more genuine interested in what we have to say. Unconditional service. What does it look like? Maybe it's taught time for parents of preschool age children where we have little, you know, bring in the moms who, who are frazzled because they've got little ones nipping at their ankles all day and they don't have a moment to sit down and have a Uh, an adult conversation with anyone else and they would give anything if someone would just give them an hour or two of the day to watch their child and so the church opens its doors and and says yes bring your children in in fact all the moms in the neighborhood with the little ankle biters bring them in 
Bring them in and and we'll have a story with them and we'll sing songs with them and we'll love on your children while you sit in another room and you can just kick up your feet and relax or you can chat with other moms, whatever you want to do. But bring your children in. We'll take care of them for an hour or two because we see it's a need you have. Free oil change for moms. Home extreme makeovers for those in the neighborhood whose houses they can't afford to keep up. Unconditional service may look like visiting with neighbors who are lonely, discouraged, or maybe those who just feel forgotten. In one church I served at, we were providing meals uh, for the public school children on the weekends because we found out that the schools, many of the children in that school district were dependent on the school for breakfast and lunch. And we started thinking about this. What happens on the weekend when there's no school? And so we started to put together a lunch program on the weekends for those kids. You know who showed up? We had a few kids show up. It was mostly elderly people. And we were talking with him. We found out that uh, we, we started with one need in mind. And the Lord led us to another that we kept going for years. As we found out that the elderly people, they didn't need the meal. They needed the fellowship. And so we started bringing board games out. And sure, we had a meal. We all sat down. We ate together. But then we played Monopoly and all kinds of stuff. Not bingo. We drew the line. Taking a nail out of the coffin. Did you see that? (laughs) Did you know something that Willowbrook does? It's actually happening this Wednesday uh, evening. We open up our parking lot once a month and um, uh, to um, disabled adults. And they come out here in the parking lot. Our Pathfinders have helped with it. Uh, Cliff has helped me with it. Uh, we, we pretty much just provide the space, and they take care of the rest. But they come, and they do, it's, I wouldn't call it karaoke. They're not singing along with it. Okay, we're going to put the nail back in the coffin. They're dancing to it, to, to the music. And they're having a great time. And uh, it's... it's, it's Adults with Down syndrome, adults with different, you know, that have had strokes and um, that have lost mental faculties and so forth. And we, and they're in the parking lot and we're just, we have a parking lot that can be a blessing. We have a Payton Hall that can be a blessing. Why not let it be a blessing? And in the process, they're learning that Willowbrook loves people. Why? Because Willowbrook serves a God that loves people so much that he was willing to serve to the extent of his own life. And we want to reflect the love of that God. The list can go on and on of things that we can, we can possibly do and things that we are doing. I mean, we are doing things. But here's what I want you to do. As I was preparing this message, I realized that, you know the difference between a lecture and a sermon? It's whether or not it has an appeal. It's the only difference. And I realized I'm going to make an appeal here, and then I'm going to get inundated with everybody's ideas of what the church should do. And I thought to myself, no, 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 don't you dare come to me with your idea of what we should do. You develop your idea and let the church give you the blessing to run with it and serve in God's big backyard. I do not want to hear any one of you come to me and say, Pastor, here's my idea. What are you going to do with it? Because I'll put it back right in your lap and said, great idea, run with it. Okay, there may be a few bad ideas. I don't know. Maybe we should have a clearinghouse. (laughs) But the point is, God is calling you to serve. He says, follow me. If you were to come to the office and ask 
for, you know, how are you going to do this? How are we going to turn this into a church program? You know what that is? That's having your hands on the plow and looking back. You, God has called you to follow him. Follow him wherever he might lead. And learn to love the people in his big backyard. So our closing song today is Day by Day number 532. Please stand. May the Lord bless you with a profound sense of his call. May he encourage each heart here with a profound sense of his presence. And may each person sense the equipping of the Spirit, enabling them to follow the Lamb wherever he might lead. And Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your spirit in such measure that our hearts would overflow with love, the love that you have for us. May it spill into the lives of others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.